what we're going to be doing in this session is, I think, mostly talking about it. The ritual section will be just a very short component, but uh, if you're remembering things that you've seen in pujas, now is definitely the time to talk about it. So we'll start by setting our motivation and then we'll dig right in. Sange chudon sogi chunam thai jancho padu dani kapsu chi dagi chun yen gi pe sonam ki rola pinche sange drupa show sange chudon sogi chunam la jancho padu dani kapsu chi Dagi chun yen ki pe sonam ki Rola pinche sange jupa sho sange Churun so ki chunam la Jan chu padu dani kapsu chi Dagi chun yen ki pe sonam ki Rola pinche sange jupa sho Okay. So when we went through the Guru Puja and we were looking at basically the elaborated form of the seven limb prayer, you know, an extended version, a deeply connected version, a more elaborate version of the seven limb prayer, a more elaborate version of refuge in Bodhicitta and refuge in bodhicitta with a very tantric thrust with that connotation of speed and urgency in order to become enlightened quickly for the benefit of all sentient beings. So, you know, it, it's a long practice by some standards, short by others, but when you were kind of I don't know, trying to get your head around the chanting or giving up on the chanting and looking at the English instead, or however you were sort of relating to the practice. Were there any points that you feel comfortable sharing, either that were particularly heart connecting or particularly confusing? Um, I was uh, looking at verse 43 through 45. That yeah, for the benefit of the guru, correct? Like uh, the guru doesn't need to be benefited, no. Um, but in order no, to connect but the I mean, guru, yeah, we're, we're requesting that yes. we're recalling the guru's qualities, right? So it's yeah. okay to recall um, the qualities on all those three sections if you don't have the empowerment. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a good question, and the thing is, is that there is meaning in the verses that you can access fairly quickly without a huge amount of study and without empowerment that has significance, has power. And then there's layers of meaning which require empowerment and require commentary. So at the level of which you've already studied, you already have some sense of Dharmakaya, Sambhogakaya, Nirmanakaya, and can relate to the guru as being oneness with those concepts. So the layers that are deeper than that, or the um, ways in which it gets fleshed out and nuanced when you start to practice highest yoga tantra, is just going to be variations on a theme. It's not going to be a whole radical pivot to something other than what you're already starting to learn about anyway. So as it's written, it's fine to connect with those aspects that you already have familiarity with. And those parts that are confusing, you just put on the shelf and say, I'll come back to those. So that's why even just the headings can have some connection of, oh, the Dharmakaya, the mind of all the Buddhas, one in nature with the guru. Oh, the Sambhogakaya, that aspect that's accessible to Arya Bodhisattvas, one in nature with the guru. Oh, the Nirmanakaya, that aspect which can manifest in a myriad different forms to teach sentient beings, one in nature with the guru. Even that level of understanding has power, doesn't it? So it's perfectly fine to connect in that way and it's good to connect in that way. And there will be- yeah, I, I love follow. that part. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's yeah, a that was part. That was a really extraordinary piece. Uh, I just have a couple of other really quick questions. Sure. Um, page 40, the ma name mantra. Mm. Is holding have the that double. Um, yeah, there's a double um, diamond in front of name or mantra recitation. And I think in other versions I've come across of different 
different pujas, that meant that that was not to be recited, but I didn't see any notes in this particular version. Um, it's optional, but common. So the, the okay. mountain recitation time where you do His Holiness's name mantra, Lama Zokarimpshe's name mantra, Lama Tsongkhapa, it's uh, see it as a blessing and a connection. Or if it's just too weird and it's just not your style or you're worried that it's the wrong thing and you're generating doubts and obstacles, just do Shakyamuni Buddha's name mantra through that whole section while everyone else is doing other things. Just Tayata, Om Muni Muni, Maha Muni, so ah, that whole section. So it's an optional section, but a very common section to be inserted. Yes. And then um, similarly, my la very last question is um, LC 109. So I know that 110, 111, 112 um, are different, but 109, it's preparing yourself for the tantric path. And just the way that it was stated, I was like, oh, I don't know, maybe that could be recited if you had that intention at some, you know, some point. All of it can that, be recited. Yeah, all of it can be recited. Okay. Um, the parts that are almost always done in Tibetan that are not really for people without empowerments, if you're saying it in Tibetan, you're not really deeply embedded in the English, hopefully. Anything that's read out loud in English is okay for you to read out loud in English and to feel connection with. So your chant leader hopefully know the difference <laughs> between the open verses suitable for the general public and the closed verses which are done in Tibetan in order to um, not give too much air time to the concepts that will confuse people. Okay. Of course, a lot of the Tibetan verses are also open, but they're done in Tibetan in order to connect with the blessings of the lineage and to connect with the Dakinis and all of these sorts of things. So sometimes Tibetan is not because secret, it's because blessings. But if guided in English, feel okay to say it in English and to connect with the meaning in English. Yeah. And especially the so stages of the path prayer, the stages of the path prayer that goes through the six perfections and then into Vajrayana aspiration and then on to that. Really, that is the part where uh, beginners or intermediate students who don't yet have Tantra should really give their strongest emphasis because these are the things that you already know. So really, you know, drill down into those sections and really think touching base with the six perfections, touching base with aspiration for Tantra and just really let those things get woken up. It's all your old friends, you know, aspects of seven point mind training and Tonglen and all that beautiful stuff from Sutra, the perfection vehicle, it really um, warms the heart to kind of come back to your old friends after you're doing all of this kind of mystical, magical, woo woo stuff that it's a little bit um, esoteric. <laughs> you kind of ground yourself back into, right, patience is good. Yep. <laughs> you know, it can be really helpful. Yeah. Yeah, Christine, go ahead. Sure. So I was very moved by the practice and had this expanded awareness of emptiness throughout the whole day yesterday, which was very interesting. I mean, it was so accessible to me and it was a really challenging day and I just kept going to emptiness. Mm -hmm. And I've done it quite a bit here at Land of Medicine Buddha, but this, for whatever reason, moved me in a very deep way. So thank you for that. So my question is, and it was a very difficult, I, I was very aggravated, as I told you during the practice, and I kept, yeah, yeah. Did, uh, you know, I kept afterwards, fogging out. <laughs> yep. Yeah, and I didn't want to, I was like, when's this going to finish? And like, wow, this is too long. And <laughs> another one, like, I thought there was only 105 verses. It keeps going. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent candor. Thank you for that. <laughs> really, it was all going on. I was like, why am I not liking this practice? Something's happening. Then I had this blissful but afterwards, day. yeah. Yeah, and I'm like, what's what is the Vendroy often doing to us? Where is she taking me? Like, well, like, so <laughs> not me, man. I saw obvious, obvious I should do this practice, and I wanted to know how. I don't know how to do it without sog. Is yeah. there instruction somewhere to do it without sog? Yeah, it just skipped the sog. It says in that in the PDF usually if you're not doing SOG, skip to verse, yada yada. I think oh, it'll, it'll say, say that. Okay. Yeah. That's fine then. I can follow but that. Verse 55 is where the SOG section starts. So you just okay. go straight through until and stop at verse 54. Okay. And then jump to um verse 84. Yep. So okay. So uh, you go to the end of verse 54 and then jump 
and start again verse 84 to the end. And if you're doing if I'm do, do, do I have to have that altar set up to do it if I'm not doing saw? Can I just do it at my with my regular altar, my yeah, regular water yeah, bowl? Um, if you're not doing SOG, can you see the water bowls? Yes. You need the set of four waters. Okay. But, um, so you need a water bowl set up um, with the four waters because during that practice, you're offering the four waters. So you want to have the four waters. Um, so you're just regular um, tantric water bowl set up, just add two bowls. Yep, good, or visualize, or add um, <laughs> add water or something. Yeah, just something that is acknowledging the four waters are happening and uh, good to go. And then that's all I have to do. And then I can do it at, you know, okay. Yep. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And as I mentioned yesterday, it's one of Lama Zopa Rinpoche's heart practices. He does it every single day. He probably does it with SOG every day because that's how he rolls, but um, you don't have to do it with SOG every day. Or you can do abbreviated SOG, which is like one paragraph. Abbreviated SOG is fine too. Yeah. So for those of you without highest yoga tantra, I really recommend you do it um, without SOG as much as you can. Um, SOG is uh, the very highest yoga tantra part. Christine has that so she can do it by herself. But um, for the rest of us, it's an, you know, for the rest of you, it's an amazing practice, even divorced from SOG. So know that. And SOG is not exclusive to Lama Chopa Guru Puja. There is SOG in any number of other practices. It's just in our tradition, this is the practice we most regularly plug it into. So that's why we're talking about it, common prayers and practices. Um, and you know, it was composed by the, the first Panchen Lama um, and Lausanne Chiki Gelsen. And so it's been kind of the, the heart of many very advanced practitioners paths for centuries you know it's it's an amazing know. thing so no need to reinvent the wheel it's all there in the guru puja yeah it's beautiful so um uh, amanda had a question yesterday about mahayana's four spheres which is referenced in the verses of auspiciousness so i thought i would start with her question and then jump into some other things um for Basic information on Lama Chopa and Saul, you can always go to Lama Yeshi Wisdom Archive and just type in the search function. Some of it will be a little bit, you know, kind of out of your lane if you're new to this practice, but it can clarify a lot of things quickly. For those of you that do have highest yoga tantra, um, there's two main texts that are really useful. One is the Union of Bliss and Emptiness by His Holiness the Dalai Lama. And this one is particularly significant because it was teachings requested by Lama Zopa Rinpoche on behalf of our organization. And so there's a really strong karmic connection with us in the FPMT and His Holiness and Lama Zopa and that commentary specifically. So the union of bliss and emptiness. The other one is um, Manjushri's Innermost Secret. Manjushri's Innermost Secret is a Dei Chen Ling publication and um, it is a very solid, very comprehensive text and it's by Kanchen Yeshi Geltsen, translated by David Gonzalez. So um, those two, if you have highest yoga tantra, will hold you in very good stead in terms of your ongoing practice. Okay, so starting with um, Amanda's question, what are Mahayana's four spheres or wheels? The four wheels are explained by Nagarjuna when he states, abiding in a land that is conducive to practice, relying upon a holy being, having merit through making prayers of excellent nature, you are empowered by these four wheels. So the meaning is one, a conducive environment, two, meeting a holy being, three, making excellent pet prayers, and four, having extensive merit, that these four are gonna support your practice of the Mahayana. So when you see in verse 17, Mahayana's four spheres or four wheels, this is what it's referring to. And it's not a list that we talk about as a list very often, although we reference all of these elements quite regularly. So anyway, that's Amanda's question. Thanks for asking that. Maybe go research it and i um, happy to refine it. Um, then the next question is going to be, what is SOG? <laughs> okay, so here we're looking at verses 55 to 69. And this is from Lama Zopa Rinpoche. 
first, there needs to be a brief introduction to the Sulk offering practice to help others to understand more, to elaborate a little on the explanation, the meaning of Sulk. It does not just mean torma and foods that you offer. That is not the meaning. This is more extensive explanation of what Sulk is and the importance of and benefits of it. So when only male yogis gather, it is called a feast of heroes. And when only female yoginis gather, it is called a feast of heroines. When both males and females gather, it is called a feast of yogis and yoginis, heroes and heroines. This is what is called sog. So it's the gathering. So usually we say sog as this beautiful, delicious food that then we meditate on transforming it into oceans of uncontaminated wisdom nectar that is then offered to the guru deity. But actually that is one aspect, the big part is the gathering. And that's why there's so much emphasis at doing it in person, doing it together, doing it at your Dharma centers, because the real Tsog involves a gathering of both male and female tantric practitioners. So it is said by Pandit Ratna Raksharita, those doing the activities of the heroes, it's called the Feast of Heroes. Similarly, those doing the activities of yoginis, it is called the Feast of Heroines. Those whose minds are enriched with a control of the circle of the integrated method and wisdom, that is called the circle of unification. So the very highest meaning of Tsog is to join method and wisdom. The real meaning of experiencing Tsog is the transcendental wisdom, non-dual great bliss, the wisdom of emptiness, the non-duality of that, and uniting these two. That is the very essence of Tsog. It is the offering of that experience, oneself experiencing it, the male and female heroes and heroines, of which the essence is the guru deity, and oneself also experiencing that as the guru deity, the real meaning of Tsog is integrating method and wisdom, the transcendental wisdom, non-dual bliss and voidness. This is the secret meaning. The need for the actual Tsog substances is to develop the very heart of the Mahayana and Tantric path that brings enlightenment in one brief lifetime of these degenerate times, because it ceases the defilements quickly including the actual negative imprints left on the mental continuum by the delusions. And it is the quickest way to collect extensive merit, which takes three countless great eons on the Paramita path to collect and achieve enlightenment. Here, in a brief lifetime of these degenerate times, using the transcendental wisdom of non-dual bliss and voidness to increase this, one needs to enjoy these Sog substances. So logistically, when is Sog? It's the 10th and the 25th of the Tibetan month. So not our calendar, 10th and 10th, 25th, but the lunar calendar of the Tibetan calendar. And so you can find on the Tibetan calendar the Sog days. And according to the Haruka root tantra, the best time to do Sog is the nighttime. So offering extensive food and drink, always do it nighttime. Why? Because it is admired to do at nighttime always wander at nighttime and always gather at nighttime. This means that the dakas and dakinis always wander at nighttime and gather at nighttime. The Tibetan 11th month, Galdawa, is a special time for Mother Tantra, a special time for Vajyogini, and a special month to offer Vajyogini Tsolk. The Tibetan 12th month is a special time for Father Tantra, a special time for Chakrasambara, and a special month to offer a chakra sambara tsulk. Especially in these two months, it's very important to offer tsulk. So much to unpack. Yes, much to unpack. So first of all, dakas and dakinis moving at nighttime, therefore do sog at night, is gonna be a little bit like, uh, what? <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> but um, I think we already have some intuitive understanding of this. Sometimes it's called the witching hour, right? Or if you have children or animals, they go a little bit cuckoo around sunset, don't they? 
Yeah, that kind of like approaching sunset, the kids get all kind of fractious, giggling or fighting. The cats or the dogs will do their zoomies, you know, when they're racing around the house, the zoomies of the cats and dogs. Um, you sometimes feel a little bit energized and awakened and like a second wind, you know, like you got worn out from the day at work, you know, you got home, you put your feet up, you're like, oh, and then somewhere around sunset, you kind of perk up again and maybe you've got another round in you. There's an energetic shift after sunset. And that energetic shift that we all feel is considered to be related to the movement of dakas and dakinis, the movement of these inspiring holy being figures that uplift the mind and support practice. So what a daka and dakini is, I'm gonna talk about in a moment. But this time of day in the evening of doing tzog, um, it's kind of making the most of that shift that happens naturally each day. Yeah, but, and, uh, and then doing it on those two days that related to the lunar calendar, I think that we also feel shifts during the month when there's, you know, some sort of transition, some sort of transformation within a lunar cycle. So it's, it's just kind of using the momentum of what happens naturally in alignment with the Earth's rhythms. And the Earth's rhythms, of course, are related to the minds of the beings who inhabit it. And there's a you know, symbiotic relationship. What created the world, what created the universe, us <laughs> and our karma for better and for worse. So there's a relationship. And so somehow synchronizing with that in these tantric practices, it's not like the most important part of the practice, but it's useful. So when we do Lama Chopa Guru Puja without Sog, often it's done in the morning to kind of launch your day. But when it's done with Sog, we try and do it after sunset. When you can, yeah, for those reasons. So that's kind of some interesting esoteric stuff to understand, but there it is. Um, Sog as the gathering of heroes and heroines, this is a very important tantric idea that men and women are equal and that men and women are necessary, and that the energies that each of the genders bring or all of the genders bring enriches practice and that within ourselves, we also have masculine and feminine energy that needs to be resolved and integrated and balanced for ourselves as an individual as well. Not just the two, you know, sort of physical biological genders, not uh, something about gender constructs from society, but physiologically. All sorts of stuff about gender in Tantra, which is really interesting. But what it all boils down to is we have a representative of method and a representative of wisdom, and they need to be united within a community and within a practitioner. There are added layers and nuances once you study highest yoga tantra and have those empowerments. But in terms of general knowledge, that's a really lovely thing about Buddhism is the explicit equality of the genders. So of course, in some societies that Buddhism has entered into, there's a lot of misogyny and problems in terms of gender roles and in terms of balance and all that kind of stuff. That'll happen because of the societies that Buddhism enters into. But Buddhism itself is very equal. So Tantra very much emphasizes this equality and even addresses the potential for inequality by recommending to practitioners particularly elevate and respect women. Just to kind of like counter the fact that the tendency of society has been the other way. So Tantra is fundamentally about the equality of the genders and fundamentally about equalizing the gender energies within oneself as an individual. And all of that representing method and wisdom need to be combined. So, you know, if you're a beginning Buddhist and you've learned about the mantra Om Mani Peme Hum, you know that Om Mani Peme Hum is basically saying the path to enlightenment is having compassion with wisdom and wisdom with compassion and those two united within your heart is what leads to enlightenment. Yes, Om, enlightened body, speech of mind, Mani, the jewel representing compassion. Padme, the lotus representing wisdom. Whom, may it integrate, may it take hold. This together, this mantra is very much showing us tantra psychology. 
And the very basic logic is obvious to us that wisdom without compassion is cold and intellectual and divorced from lived experiences of suffering sentient things. That compassion on its own without wisdom can become overly identified with suffering and get depressed and fatigued and slip into something that is not compassion or it can become too sweet, too enabling, too um, enmeshed, all sorts of problematic things can happen with compassion without wisdom. So we know these things as adults in the world, but by having one mantra that integrates the two, we're reminding ourselves, may there never be one without the other. So all of these ideas come together in the whole concept of why you need both men and women practitioners present at an assembly of SOG. So then the substances of SOG are the delicious, beautiful foods, and then the bala and mandana, which are the tantric substances specific to SOG in this context. And all of those substances are things to act as a catalyst to transform the mind. So the substances themselves start out as delicious, beautiful food, but through your meditation, they become transformed into oceans of uncontaminated wisdom nectar. How, why? You think this is delicious. Oh, deliciousness is empty of inherent existence. Can I hold the knowledge that deliciousness is empty of inherent existence while experiencing deliciousness? I can, I offer that to the guru. And then the guru says, yum, and it comes back to me. That is the very simplified explanation, okay? But it's a beautiful psychology because having allowed yourself to recognize how much attachment we have to delicious food, allowing ourselves to remember that that craving and grasping is a projection, that it's a symptom of grasping at inherent existence. And by remembering that it's empty of inherent existence, doesn't remove the fact that it's still a condition for pleasure on the tongue. So you hold that. And that is one of the best practices in Buddhism is to be able to experience attachment without giving in to attachment, to experience pleasure without it being a catalyst for attachment. It's what you do on the sutra path with the four close placements of mindfulness, where you're noticing the arising of feeling of pleasant, unpleasant, and neutral but not letting it turn into attachment, aversion, and indifference. So it's just elevated from the work that you're already starting to do. It's a beautiful way to kind of use all of your senses for the path, rather than all of your senses as being distra distractions to the path. So the beautiful food is there, but the beautiful food is just a catalyst for a meditative process that you go through. So for people without highest yoga tantra, you can just think beautiful, blissful food, which is empty of inherent existence, I offer to the guru deity. For people with highest yoga tantra, the guru deity means something more and deeper and more merged and integrated with your own practice. But without highest yoga tantra, you can still have that thought of method and wisdom combined in this offering to the guru deity. Are you following me or have I lost you in my words? <laughs> Too many words, it's okay. Um, we've been doing the practice of Lama Chopo is Sog for the center um, for the past two years on, online. And um, we don't have a community of Dhaka Sentinel. We don't have the arrows and arrow ends. It's mostly women in the entire two years have only been two occasions when there has been a man in the room. So is that yeah. not really a, a, a proper offering of SOG or? It's, it's better than nothing, absolutely better than nothing. And of course, in the tantric monasteries and nunneries, we have the same problem. It's either all men or all women, right? So in theory, our Western Dharma centers could be the perfect place to do fully fledged, fully functioning Zog because we can have both male and female practitioners, both monks and nuns, you know, lay people, all of the whole fourfold assembly of the Sangha, everybody at our Dharma centers is what we want, right? We want monks, we want nuns, we want lay women, we want laymen, and all four is the best functioning community. 
of course, it's not going to always happen. So anybody that is more than just you by yourself is great. <laughs> And even just you by yourself is also great. But SOG to be like fully qualified SOG absolutely needs both men and women. Yeah. But yeah, definitely still virtuous, still worth doing, still helps you keep your tantric samayas, even though there's some elements that are not quite there. You can purify all of that with just doing your normal practices. So slowly, slowly, but um, the fact that you're doing it regularly is hugely beneficial because it also means that when new people come, they can kind of slide into the slipstream that you've all been creating together and it won't be so clunky. You know, if everybody's new, it's a bit of a jangle, you know, and it's all kind of like tiring and no one is holding it except for the chanting leader and then they get all pooped out and you know if they take a breath the whole house of cards falls apart it's a whole thing right so the fact that you're doing it consistently is hugely beneficial on so many levels even just for community development yeah so please proceed even if you've got no boys <laughs> tell them to come <laughs> um amanda uh, I was interested in um, the part about it being like a feast um, because the times I've done it was at a teacher centre in Bendigo and um, I was brand new and um, I remember when we were given part of the SOG I was really surprised and um, really thrilled and it really did feel like a feast and um, then sharing it with the hungry ghosts. And so when I was reading that um, slide, um, I sort of, it made me think um, that the whole bit about wisdom and compassion and all the things you've been describing, it's like it's, um, uh, how do I say this? But it's like it's in the atmosphere of the whole puja, you know, because the people doing it with a lot of understanding are sharing all that nice stuff and seeing us in aspect of a deity, you know, like, mm. like really kind. And, um, and why not? I mean, that's the best thing to celebrate. Like that's a real good cause for a party. And so I guess, um, you know, back in the day, there would be all sorts of people at, at the Guru Pujas. There would be maybe, you know, seven-year-old boys and, you know, just the young monks. There would be all sorts. Oh, yeah. And I just thought um, it's such a generous puja because it's picking everybody up, you know, wherever they are. So I just wanted to share that. That's all. Yeah. Yeah, I'm glad you said that. And, and I know what you mean, because before I had highest yoga tantra and I would go to puja, I still felt uplifted by the group practice and I still felt deep connection with it, even though I didn't have any idea intellectually what was going on. There was still a great power in the room because of everybody's combined practice and it was so meaningful. And as you said, generous, you know, you, you really feel like you're being led in on, on some almost like a little kid who gets to sit in on a grown-up conversation or something, you know, but in a very powerful, deeply moving way. And the feast part and the abundance part is so nourishing part of community connection. So that whole element of food being involved satisfies a number of things that just human community development involve, the sharing of food, you know? So it's, it's an interesting medium for practice. It's a very interesting medium for practice. So, um, and, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, sorry to butt in there, but I think one of the feelings I got was a feeling of being enveloped mm. and not as individually me, but just I felt enveloped and accepted. And, and that's really what the Buddha's teaching, isn't it? That we all have Buddha nature, we're all accepted. So just in the, the whole dynamic of it and the sincerity of the senior monks, um, you know, you can just pick up on that and, and it shows you how, you know, like these ideas, how they 
they uh, the point of it is to be experienced and felt, you know, and, and given out, you know, it's not just that we read it and think it and everything, but that someone, a stranger can just walk in and feel it and then, yeah. Yeah, and, and it waters their imprints and gets them, yeah, into yeah. the flow of it. Yeah, absolutely. It, it, I felt so very grateful, you know, and then that made me want to engage more, so. Exactly. For, yeah. Yeah, no, it's, it's a huge thing. And I'm, I'm really glad that you said that, because especially if you've never experienced it in a great big group, you know, I'm picturing you there in the Bendigo Gampa or even in the great stupa, you know, and it is a big, huge group. And you are just like, you know, in a state, you know, it's an interesting, transformative, transcendental, like amazing state that you get into. And so much of that is based on so many people practicing at once. So you can get it going with a small group, but it's so much easier the bigger it gets. You know, so for some things, the bigger it gets, the more unwieldy it gets. But for Guru Puja Tsog, the bigger it gets, the better it gets, you know, as if you got a good sound system. <laughs> so it's one of these things where um, the more bodies, the better. And as Dharma centers, and I know a lot of you are in leadership positions in Dharma centers, However, you can make it a community experience where on either side of it, there's community stuff for connection, chatting, asking questions, people saying, I don't know about that part, we need a class on that, you know, and just that kind of really dynamic community, casual conversation, like before it's SOG, putting it in the newsletter, we're all organizing the SOG, we need people to help make it beautiful on the altar. And then afterwards, we need people to help clean up, but you also get to drink all the extra chai and you also get to snack on the dog while you clean up and chat, you know, so it's fun cleanup. Come on, guys, you know, and just ways that you can anchor it on either end of the practice to meet those more worldly human needs that help nourish beginner practitioners so that the parts that are more confusing and esoteric in the middle of it aren't off putting enough for them not to come back. Because some people have amazing imprints and the first time they're like, yep, I'm going to this every single time forever and ever. And some people are like, what? <laughs> right? And everything in between. So as much as you can meet the multi-level layers of needs of senti things, I think the better. And um, some of my best friendships came from preparing for pujas and cleaning up after pujas. <laughs> some of my best friends were made that way. So it's fun. So, okay, so more bits about the SOG section. So this verses 55 through 67, this is where we're blessing and offering the SOG itself. And there's references throughout these practices of dutsi or nectar. And this is kind of the broader category where sometimes we're talking about SOG as becoming nectar, sometimes other things are nectar, but the concept of nectar is an interesting one. So I thought to just take this opportunity to tell you about that as well. So the meaning of nectar is not some special taste like honey. In Tibetan, the word is dutsi, du is mara, and si is medicine. So here, du is ordinary appearance and ordinary concepts, delusions, negative imprints, defilements. Tsi means medicine. The ultimate medicine is the transcendental wisdom of non-dual bliss and voidness, which is like an atom bomb to cut through those delusions, which are the Maras, right? So we talk about Mara like a demon or like the demon that tempted Buddha right before his enlightenment, but we're talking about delusions. So this is the medicine that cuts through delusions. So one has to think of the meaning of nectar, dutsi, the transcendental wisdom of non-dual bliss and voidness. By taking that nectar, you generate that experience within you. If you don't have the actual experience of that, then you visualize it. So that blesses the mind, body, and chakras, the winds and drops. It becomes a preparation to achieve the path, the highest tantra accomplishing path of illusory body and light that enables you to achieve the result in dharmakaya and rupakaya. Then one is able to offer perfect works for sentient beings without the slightest mistake until everyone, every single sentient being is brought to enlightenment. 
this is what the material stuffs of the food are transformed into. They're transformed into nectar, into dutsi. And that means treat the food with respect because it's not food anymore, it's nectar. So this is why before the food is offered at SOG, you can have bags of groceries on the floor, you can be, you know, kind of moving it around, you can be placing it and replacing it and not worry too much about it. You get it up onto the altar, you make it beautiful. But once you've done Lama Chup at SOG, and the SOG has been then distributed to the assembly, and you take home your little bag of SOG with you, do not give it to the dog, <laughs> right? Do not throw it in the trash. Do not um, treat it like junk food. You know, really respect the meaning that comes with it. And if for some reason the actual substances of the food you're like allergic to, or it's gonna break your diet, or you know, trigger some sort of hypoglycemic episode or something, you can offer the SOG to another human being who is also going to treat it with respect. You can give away your own salt, that's okay. But make sure you're giving it to someone who will treat it with respect. If you're giving it to children, make sure they're not gonna put it on the floor, even if they don't really know what it means. Just kind of help it have an elevated aspect because this is not just food now. It started as food, but now it's more. Does that make sense? It's become nectar. So because it's Guru Puja Lama Chopa, we need to kind of talk a little bit about the guru, right? <laughs> what is the guru? And just make sure we're all on the same page here because this is a highest yoga tantra practice. So the way in which the guru is described is all of the layers of guru combined. But that means you arrive at the tantric view. So there are levels of a guru relationship, right? The fundamental vehicle or um, the foundational vehicle, the poly tradition vehicle used to be called the Hinayana, but we don't say Hinayana now because it's very pejorative. So the fundamental vehicle, the perfection vehicle and the Vajra vehicle texts reveal a progression in the way of regarding and relating to teachers. So our fundamental vehicle teacher instructs us on the four truths, gives us refuge and lay or monastic precepts and teaches us the Vinaya, the monastic discipline. So as such, he or she acts as a representative of the Buddha. We see our teacher as a teacher, our preceptor as a preceptor and relate to him or her on a human level. We regard him as a wise elder a senior practitioner from whom we can learn. So this is where we start out at, even in the Lam Rim, although in the Lam Rim, we're already starting to elevate this relationship. But on the, on the fundamental vehicle level, the guru is like a mentor, right? They're like a spiritual friend. And at that level, you're trying to see how all of the teachings are personal advice. So all of the teachings of the Dharma are personal advice for you as an individual. And when you go to this teacher's teachings, you try to hear the teachings like that. And when you're listening for personal advice, you hear personal advice. When you're listening for general knowledge that applies to anyone, you hear general knowledge that applies to anyone, right? So the teacher at this level may or may not be a Buddha, may or may not be special, but you're choosing to see them as the representative of the Buddha, so you really are respecting them in the teaching context, particularly, and trying to hear personal advice through them. And I think that we've probably all had this experience of foundational level relationship with teachers, where we go to a Dharma class with someone who we've maybe taken refuge with, but not bodhisattva vows, not tantric vows, nothing more than that. But we hear something very specific to our life. And it just goes straight to the heart and you think they are talking to me, they must have clairvoyance. And they might not, but because of your receptivity in that relationship, the Buddhas are able to get to you. Yeah, they can get to you easier. They're trying to get to you the whole time to help you out, but our blockages, our karmic obscurations, our heart closed, our paranoia, our suspicion, all of our authority issues, all of that, gets in the way of hearing the advice that's being flooded at us. 
So this foundational level teacher, you treat them with great respect, but you don't need to think that they're enlightened. You just think that the enlightened mind can get to you through their teachings when you're in front of them, and you can kind of leave it at that. So we start there with our guru-disciple relationships. And even on this level, of course, you want to check someone for a great length of time before you make that commitment. You know, it's a big deal, even though it's still at that foundational level. So again, you know, um, wait, <laughs> don't jump into it. But that doesn't mean you can't go to many, many teachings and have many, many positive experiences before you've made that relationship like formalized. So just by going to a teaching with someone doesn't mean you're formalizing that relationship. In fact, you need to for a long time before it becomes uh, clear whether or not that's a good idea. Okay, so that's one level. Then perfection vehicle or the Mahayana, the Mahayana vehicle before we get to Tantra. So intro Mahayana. The perfection vehicle texts speak of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas emanating in many forms to benefit others. Since our perfection vehicle teacher leads us on the bodhisattva path and gives us bodhisattva ethical restraints, we view that person as an emanation of the Buddha or a high bodhisattva. So we change the way we view them. They're an emanation of the Buddha or a high bodhisattva. Here, the teacher is seen as equal to or like a Buddha in the sense that the karma accumulated in relation to our teacher is similar to that accumulated in relation to the Buddha. By making offerings or to or harming our perfection vehicle teacher, we accumulate karma equal to acting in a similar way towards the Buddha himself. So on this level, you are trying to see the teacher as like the Buddha or equal to the Buddha, but whether or not they're a Buddha can re remain an ambiguity. Does that make sense? So you're trying to see them as a Buddha, but you don't have to be certain about whether or not they are. You're just trying to hold that view because it elevates the way that you listen and it elevates the connection, but you don't have to know who they actually are or be certain about that. It's just an elevated form of respect. And in so doing, then you get a more direct transference of Dharma wisdom. Yeah. So it's a practical consideration, but it's, it's a very powerful thing to do because you're starting to move towards the tantric view of seeing all of their ordinary behaviors as somehow a teaching for you as an individual. Okay, so then we get into the Vajra vehicle and the Vajra vehicle or the Tantra vehicle. This is where we start talking about guru yoga. So when we have trained in the fundamental vehicle and perfection vehicle practices, and are sufficiently mature in the Dharma, we may request empowerment into the practices of various tantric meditational deities. Students imagine the guru giving the empowerment to be the meditational deity and the environment to be the deity's abode or mandala, like those four purities we were talking about a few weeks ago. When doing tantric practice following empowerment, we imagine ourselves and all sentient beings as Buddhas and the environment as a pure land. In this case, not seeing our tantric master as a Buddha would be strange. Only in tantric practice is it essential to regard the tantric master as a Buddha. This view should not be taught to beginners who are not mature in the Dharma because it is open to misinterpretation and confusion. So you can see how if someone went into this practice with too much, I guess, naivete, or if they're too gullible, or if they're vulnerable and fragile, they might jump into this relationship with someone who is not a suitable vessel, and that's how cults are formed, or that's how abuse can happen. All sorts of terrible things can happen if the student is not ready or the guru is not qualified. So this is something that you want to go into eyes wide open, really having assessed the person that you're taking the empowerment from. Because it's the empowerment itself that implies the elevated commitment to now regard that master as a Buddha. At least when you're on your cushion doing your tantric practice, at the very least, you're seeing that the deity that you're practicing is one with 
the guru who gave you the empowerment. So deity yoga is the main practice in Tantra and it includes guru yoga. They're intrinsically one with one another. Guru yoga is a method or skillful means for generating ourselves in fervent devotion that enables us to effortlessly see the guru as to himself. At first, this devotion might not be natural or spontaneous, so we must employ various techniques to help us achieve this. Chiefly, we must always remember the excellent qualities of the teacher, especially his kindness to us. By repeatedly generating confidence, appreciation in the guru, and devotion towards him, a time will come when the mere mention of his name or the thought of him will stop all our ordinary perceptions and we will see him as the Buddha himself. So Song Rinpoche said that the tantric guru opens the door to an entirely new world of experience by introducing the disciples to the mandala of the deity he or she will practice. Having received this initiation, the disciple is usually expected to maintain certain commitments to the guru called samayas. Often these commitments are seen as the most sacrosanct aspect of the tantric path, as they are intended to protect and preserve the essential quality of the relationship to the deity through the vehicle of the guru. Formally, these commitments are the tantric vows, but informally, this refers to the practitioner's deep-rooted devotion to the deity and to their innate, clear nature. When we're at Guru Puja, who are we offering this to? It is all of those levels. And then once you actually have empowerment, all of those levels then are merging with you as the Guru deity. And that is a whole other set of discussions that we're not gonna do in this class, but that's coming. But in the beginning, if you don't have a Vajra Guru, you can really be thinking on multi-levels about maybe prayers that you've read, like calling the Guru from afar. The end verse, which says, or one of the ending verses, which says, please bless me to meet the ultimate definitive Lama, the bare face of my innate mind, with the coverings of true existence and perceiving it as true removed. So what you're really trying to come into contact with is your deepest, most fundamental level of mind and its wisdom potentiality and its ability to recognize wisdom in others and to be able to merge with that wisdom and develop into that wisdom. So it requires a deep faith in yourself. And then this outer person is a catalyst for your transformation. They're an essential condition. They're deeply necessary, but they're not bestowing upon you liberation. Yeah, they're not sprinkling you with pixie dust and making you into a Buddha, but they're, the relationship with them is very fundamental to your progress. So there's a lot of ways to look at this. And you know, one of these days we should do a good um, levels of the guru class in and of itself. But when you're doing so, really think that you are offering to all levels of guru, even if you yourself don't yet have all levels of guru. Does that make sense? Okay. So um, what I'm gonna do is we'll have a break and then I'll lead the SOG section, which includes blessing and offering the SOG, the distribution of the SOG and the offering of the remaining SOG. And I'm just going to go through it and um, I won't have my camera on, but at some point I'm going to have to leave the room and take the remaining SOG outside. So um, when there is a pause, that is what's happening. And, um, and then after that, uh, we'll have like a five minute stretch and, um, and then we'll talk about those remaining sections. Okay, so, um, so 10 minute break and then we'll come back and do SOG itself. 